Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining Sikich's Yellow Book webinar series. Um, today's session is, oh no, we're investigating suspicions of fraud. Something no one really wants to think about, but um, something as, as finance professionals and management professionals, we, we will encounter and we need to know how to handle it professionally. My name is Mary O'Connor. I'm a partner with Sikich. I'm in charge of the forensic and valuation services of the firm. We routinely uh, handle uh, forensic accounting issues. Uh, and when those forensic accounting issues turn into suspicions of fraud, then, then we give the work that we do some constitutional rights and uh, help our clients conduct an investigation. Also, a big part of what we do is helping clients prepare for an incident such as that, and then to hopefully um, have better controls in place so that maybe they won't have to encounter it very often. Um, our agenda is, is relatively short today. I come at this particular topic in something of the first person in that I had the privilege to be uh, an elected commissioner of my hometown uh, for three terms. Uh, I was in charge of, I was city treasurer and I was the finance director in the commission system, um, quote unquote trustees have uh, line authority. So I had to learn very quickly that particularly in municipal government, um, you don't run it just like a business, it's government. Government's different. And the main thing that is different is when there is a suspicion of fraud, it needs to be handled professionally for the best of all reasons is you're going to have to tell the entire world about it um, uh, through, through disclo uh, disclosures to the public. Um, and the private sector doesn't have that burden. Um, they never have to go public on these things. They, don't, they, they expect to have problems but they never have to go public on it unless they want to. Everybody on, on this call today has an entirely different um, accountability. So this uh, seminar is uh, hopefully from that point of view and um, the point of view of what you encounter every day. Um, and our folks that are from the educational um, uh, services, the not-for-profits, you all have the same problem as your brethren in cities and counties. Um, how you message what happened and how you handled it is the difference between a catastrophe and, you know, just something else that professionals handle. So today's agenda is we're going to go through uh, quickly uh, a classification system for uh, what fraud is, how it tends to manifest itself. Um, and then number two, we're going to discuss the role of auditors in uncovering fraud. Unfortunately, most of our, um, uh, the people that we report to believe that if an external audit is clean, then therefore we have no fraud. And we'll find out later on why that's not true. Abductive thinking. Um, there's many ways of, of logicking and ordering the world. Um, if you are facing an investigation, um, you need to act like a cop and not like an auditor. And the dictum becomes follow the evidence, which is extremely difficult for an auditor when they have their auditor hat on. But if you frame this uh, problem and way of thinking correctly, you will, um, first of all, investigate the incident very, um, uh, very efficiently and in a very short period of time. And that's the goal of almost every investigation. And the last thing that we're gonna uh, talk about is best practices for if you uh, suspect fraud, who's called, who's the team, who's enlisted, how do you uh, collect evidence, what are, what's, what's the drill for handling that investigation in a professional way? Um, you'll find that protocol as in, in, um, in your materials. And I'm gonna to suggest to you later, that's the next thing you do is spend a couple of hours with your team 
establish your plan, and then you'll be ready to go from there. Well, somebody far smarter than me one day sat down and said, well, if we were going to classify all of the ways that we could get ripped off, how would it happen? And so this particular paradigm, and this takes a couple of slides, so picture this as a big piece of wallpaper. This is, we're looking at the top of the wallpaper. Um, under this uniform occupational fraud classification system, fraud comes in three flavors. Um, two of these are very relevant uh, to most of the people on, on this call. Uh, the third one, not so much. So let, let's start at the left, corruption. Um, corruption is everywhere from bid ring, or rigging, uh, influence peddling, um, a purchasing agent who is um, uh, in cahoots with a particular vendor. The vendor can do the job for, the do for a dollar, but uh, we get an RFP through for $3. Those types of things are considered corruption. Um, and they are, um, you know, purchasing schemes, bid rigging, illegal gratuities. That just means that's another form of, of uh, uh, bribery. Bribery is money. Gratuities are, I'm going to send you on an all expense paid vacation um, to um, Saudi Arabia um, and you know, you're just going for some policy reasons or, or to check out a product. Uh, in fact, they're paying you off. And then economic extortion doesn't happen too often, but there are, there are cases of those. Everybody on this call um, uh, can be touched by the world of corruption. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, we, we all sort of know what this is and it should be, uh, uh, particularly in your purchasing area, you want to make sure that you've got the controls in place so that you can limit as many of these things as possible. The second, fraudulent statements. Okay, fraudulent statements and, and, and fraud really generally happens in the private sector or in the publicly traded securities sector. So you'll remember back to the Enron scandal, uh, or to WorldCom. Um, those companies actually went to the trouble to develop um, reasonably stated uh, uh, financial statements, but they didn't like the results. So they would sit down and, and take out whiteout and change the numbers, change the presentation, believe it or not, send it out to the entire world. Um, Bernie Madoff was a, a financial statement forger. He just, he just did that for for account statements. Um, within private, uh, privately held companies, um, a lot of manufacturers who uh, have a great deal of inventory, you can hide a lot of um, uh, lack of profitability within the inventory account. So often those accounts are just plain wrong and you're not really changing the inventory. What's been changed is the financial statement presentation of that inventory. Within your world, you don't have a lot of reason um, to, to mess around with your financial statements. Although the great exception to that was in the village of Dixon, uh, where she used extensive um, altering of financial statements. The statements that she really altered were the financial statements that were given to the board of trustees. Um, those were completely fraudulent but I'm not sure anybody particularly looked at them. They certainly didn't ask the kind of questions that, uh, that should have been asked. So your world is touched by this, but um, not like the next slide. Asset misappropriation. Oh, all the ways that folks can either take your cash or your stuff. So look at the cash circle, the other side, inventory and all other assets. That just means your stuff. Um, and there's a number of ways that your cash can be taken. Um, disbursements, uh, first and foremost, anytime you write a check, whether it's for payroll, um, whether it's for um, a, a paying a vendor, um, and there's, there's a lot of sub-frauds within, within that category. For, for, for example, 
if um, uh, someone can get your check, which has a signature on it, they can easily alter the payee and then make a lot of copies of it. And they're off to the races to um, take money in that way. Um, a hot one right now is uh, bad behavior around uh, ACH transfers, um, particularly for any organization that is uh, doing a lot of construction right now. Your payables clerk, clerks will inevitably get a call from a contractor or at least somebody who's posing as a contractor saying, hey, um, you know, I just put in that change order. I really need that check. Would you please send it to this account? you would be surprised how often um, half a million dollars will be sent and it's gone. So um, again, it's about internal controls, isn't it? And hopefully the people I'm talking to today, uh, and this is usually the case, have pretty good controls, but they can always get better. So fraudulent disbursements, you know, uh, you, somebody sent out an, uh, an invoice and they voided it or you know, just some other altering of a check or the way that, that you disperse funds. Um, any, any kind of credit cards, uh, same thing. Um, there's a lot of leakage in that particular area. Then there's larceny, which just means people take your money that's sitting out in plain sight. Um, for example, the person that goes to the bank to deposit checks, they just simply help themselves to some of the checks. Or you have a park district that takes cash for whatever reason for um, uh, class uh, registrations. They just simply help themselves to that cash. <coughs> Excuse me. Local adjudication of tickets uh, in many mu municipalities are very open to these to these types of thefts. Oddly enough, people who take the trouble to come and pay a ticket usually pay in cash. Um, number two, there's a difference between skimming and lapping. Skimming is a big one in our area because one thing about the private sector that makes a widget, produces an invoice, sends it out, and they have a reasonable expectation that within 30 days, they will get a certain amount of money. It's called the accounts receivable system. Quite frequently, the areas that you all work in do not have that control. And it's one of the biggest controls for any um, organization. Generally speaking, you don't have that. And checks can come in from a whole lot of uh, locations, unexpected, or in amounts or at a timing that, that was unexpected. So nobody was looking for the check. Um, the story I like to tell is when I was a commissioner, um, uh, Cook County sent us a Department of Public Health uh, check for $30,000 to help us with our anti-obesity program. Well, number one, we didn't have an anti-obesity program. Number two, we just certainly did not expect um, that check to come in. I opened the mail that day. I saw the check. I, I knew no one was expecting it it would have been very easy for me to have put that in, in uh, my personal bank account. Nobody would have been the wiser. That's an example of skimming. I just want you to know I didn't do that. But that is an example of skimming. And that happens frequently, uh, particularly in the municipal setting. Now, lapping's a little different. <clears throat> lapping is where you have, let's say, a fine um, that is always $35 or always $125. And the person who takes the fines always has the same dollar amount. And so they could take a number of checks and, and say those checks were paid, um, paid for the current open accounts, but they, they're using other checks for the same amount just simply mismatching uh, the checks that were, that were stolen and, and covering up the, the, the hole in the books by the other checks that they received. It's easy to do because I took 10 checks that were $35 each. I'm replacing it with 10 checks of $35 each. Lapping is uh, 
occurs in any of those types of situations. Um, so we're, you know, wherever you take in money in equal increments, you need to have extra um, controls in place to guard against lapping. And then last but not least, people can take your stuff in so many ways, just, it, you know, uh, in the purchasing and receiving area, uh, they just pick up and walk out with them. Uh, that's why P cards are, are, are a difficulty. Uh, it's very easy to ship goods to say your home address, the invoice, usually the invoice doesn't, it's just the P card, um, it, you know, gets, gets charged to the organization. And you'd be surprised when people read invoices, they don't look over to the ship to address. So one thing you're gonna find is that folks that truly commit fraud Number one, they're not risk takers. They rarely even have a parking ticket. Um, they see a hole in a, in a system. They'll try it once, then they'll try it again. Then they realize you're not looking and they just, and they just keep doing it. They tend to do it in very small amounts repetitively. And the way they do it is not very creative. Um, so chances are uh, uh, their particular frauds have, have, have been seen before. Um, and they, it's, so it's, it, it actually, you are actually guarding against perhaps 20 methods of taking money from you. And you should certainly have your internal controls to guard against all of them. Okay, so, and, I, and I've seen the look of relief on so many boards faces. Um, the auditor shows up once a year and says, oh, I thank everybody for all the help on the audit. We, we, did, we did our job. We have an unqualified, clean opinion. And I know somebody on the board is thinking they're going to finish that sentence, and therefore, we have no fraud. It is the biggest misconception out there. Um, in case after case, most of the largest and even the smallest frauds that occur, uh, there, is an, there is an auditor who has looked at the books and who has given a clean opinion. Um, auditors do really one thing and one thing only. They are licensed to um, accredit the statements saying to the rest of the world, these statements have been prepared by an acceptable standard um, and you can rely on them, or at least you can rely on the fact that they have been prepared by a standard that both parties un un understand. Now, if an auditor is doing their job, the first thing they will do is create a map of your system. They'll see uh, holes in the system where fraud could occur. They'll tell you about that and hope that you will fix that. Um, and if they find fraud, pencils down, they can't do another thing until that issue of fraud is investigated and resolved. But it's the nature of the system and we'll, we'll talk about later. Number one, they're not employed to find fraud. They tend to find fraud by accident and this is why. Even the biggest frauds happen one drip at a time one small transaction amount at a time and then over and over it builds up but that small transaction tends to be immaterial and so no one's looking at it so frequently even though it's you have a clean opinion even though um, it can be significant fraud could be occurring the books can still balance the Bank accounts can be reconciled. Unfortunately, fraud can still occur, which is why the system I'm going to propose to you, it, it's, it's not optional. I'm telling you, it needs to be in place so that you're not depending on your auditor to locate a fraud or assuming that there is no fraud because we have a clean opinion. You've got the, the appropriate system in place to identify uh, suspicions, to investigate them quickly, uh, deal with them, or say, well, somebody was just mistaken. Also do remember, 
that um, certainly in my experience, what often looks like a fraud at first is just sheer incompetence. Uh, the staff hasn't been trained sufficiently uh, or they just misunderstand. Uh, there can be a lot of reasons for why something that looks quirky uh, it is just just really requires a different organizational response. Let's do a polling question. This is an easy one. An unqualified audit opinion means there is no fraud in the town. True or false? Okay, looks like everyone has the right answer. An unqualified audit opinion means it's an unqualified audit opinion. It does not mean there is no fraud occurring in the entity. So oh, thank you. Almost everybody got that. Okay, now back to, um, well, how, how are frauds found? Um, and most of our organizations, and we all know this, nobody wants to find a fraud. You have to be out of your mind. I mean, careers are in jeopardy, organizations are in jeopardy, money is lost, frauds are bad. So there's sort of a willful blindness in, in, in everything we do, but how are frauds found? Well, um, the a national um, organization that tracks these things um, turns out that vendors don't, don't help particularly, customers don't help. You'll notice external audit, they'll find the fraud about 10% of the time. Um, <clears throat> a good internal control group will do a pretty good job, maybe 20% of the time. Um, the by accident is, is literally true. Um, someone will go on vacation, someone will step in and just say, oh my gosh, I, you know, we have 10 bank accounts. There's 11 here. I wonder what this is, you know. Um, but overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, uh, frauds are uncovered through a tip from an employee. This is why the moral of the story today is you must have a whistleblower system in place. We'll talk about that later. But that's the number one way that um, an organization is signaled that there could there could be something out of order and that some action needs to be taken. Um, external audit sometimes, but generally speaking, it's by a knowledgeable employee through a well-constructed whistleblower system. Let's do another polling question. CPE, as we know, is important. Let's bring that up. So most frauds are discovered by internal auditors, external auditors, or a tip from an employee. Okay. Well, most often internal auditors need to get need to get some some um, uh, praise, uh, a pat on the back, but it's really a tip from an employee. And most of you uh, selected that answer. All right. Now, why does everybody have to stop being a normal accountant and a normal financial person to be able to do a good job uh, running a, um, a suspicion of fraud exercise? There are two books that I, um, you know, if you get a chance and you're looking for something to read, these are these are two good ones. Um, it, the first is The Organized Mind, and uh, this, this book is a little bit old, but he was one of the first people to, um, to, to notice, uh, you know, given current research on how the brain works. Um, there's this thing called neuroplasticity, which um, our, our brain changes constantly. Um, that's why social media and some of these things are so bad for us because our, our brain waves change through this neuroplasticity. And it's meant to, uh, we have this little reptilian brain in, in, in the center of our head, which is constantly doing a 360 
I'm in danger, I'm in danger, I'm in danger. It's, kind, it's very, very nervous, very anxious. And then we have the prefrontal cortex, which brings some logic to it and says, ah, reptile brain, calm down. It's, you're really not in danger. You're really not in danger. And then your, your logical brain is constantly telling, telling yourself why the world is okay. And so between neuroplasticity and the way our brains are constructed, we see the world, um, we're predisposed to seeing, to believing that everything's okay, no matter what the evidence is. I think we all read about these very large frauds and we think, gee, didn't anybody like get this? Um, and it turns out everybody was working overtime to, um, to make it okay that these obvious clues that were in front of them um, that should have been signals uh, were, in, were in fact, you know, yeah, that person has a very lavish lifestyle, but, oh, you know, maybe she got a lot of money in the divorce or maybe she's just a frugal person. You know, they'll find all of these reasons. That is the world of an auditor is to find how all of the evidence conforms to an outside standard. And so it's, that's kind of one of the reasons they're not particularly good, good fraud finders. And then number two, this, this book by John Nordby is really the art of thinking like a cop. Um, there's you know, three basic ways of thinking. There's induction. Um, I see, I'm, I'm from Mars and I see three accidents. And I notice that there's an ambulance at each accident. I will, I will decide inductively that accidents are caused by ambulances. Of course, that's not true. Um, deduction is, um, I believe something should be true. I look at the evidence, it either proves it or it doesn't, scientific theory and it's deduction. And then there's abductive thinking, which is thinking like a cop. And it's, it's the, um, it's the armor that you need to put on to be able to investigate a suspicion of fraud. So the mantra is follow the evidence. And people don't do that. The um, auditors, actually everybody misses, misses fraud because we are, we are looking for conformance in the system not for what is out of place. And a fraud is inherently something that's out of place. Um, and a cop will do it just the opposite. Instead of looking at a situation and trying to conform it to a system, we of course don't have a system for the fraud. We're trying to figure out, is there a fraud and then how it was done an opportunity, et cetera. We have to start start at the end and work backwards. Go ahead and ne uh, next slide. And so we need to confine ourselves not to some preconceived notion of what might have happened, or or how um, you know you for, saw it on TV or whatever. You're not conforming it to some standard. You need to figure out what the heck happened and you have to be willing to stick with the evidence and be blinded to everything else except the evidence before you. Let me give you an example. Um, there's, there's a gentleman standing outside a six unit apartment complex and he hears what he thinks is gunfire calls the police and say, yeah, I think there's gunfire. The police show up, they talk to this guy, he points to the upper, um, to apartment number six on the third floor. Thank you very much. The cops run into the apartment complex. They go to that apartment. No other apartment, they go to that apartment. Sure enough, the door has uh, bloody handprints on it. They walk in. Yep, there's a dead body. I I know there's been a, a, a murder committed. 
And then there's evidence all over. There's gun casings. There's a beer can with lipstick on it. You name it. Whatever, whatever is at the crime scene. Now the the policeman will then catalog all of that evidence, where it was at, how fresh it was, etc. They catalog it all. They're going to do their 100% of their investigation off that evidence. They will not go to another apartment unless they see bloody footprints going to another apartment to expand the investigation. So ponder that just a moment. Most, most accounting, most financial folks, when they believe there is fraud occurring, they want to expand the uh, investigation to all evidence, to the entire system. They want to look under every rock. They'll start using terms like forensic audit. Well, there is no such thing as a forensic audit because your brain will not take it all in. It'll look for a pattern that may or may not exist. The point is, if you have a suspicion of fraud, it's your goal to, to assemble the evidence, just the evidence, follow the evidence, and reach a conclusion. It's very different for it's very different from the um, system thinking that all of us do day in and day out. And we are, and we when we are investigating a suspicion of fraud, we we have to remember that we have to turn off the auditor in us and we have to go into a different mode. We also have to be comfortable that we don't know the end at the beginning. This makes financial people very nervous. They would like to know it's it's all going to be all right. That um, that you know, and I'm even going to force what I think the end is uh, at the beginning. You just need to start with your first bit of evidence. Go to your second bit, your third bit. Finally, get to no. I think there's something here, or I don't think there's something here. In which case, you would then just stop the investigation put this in a file drawer and maybe think through, should I have some better controls? So something like this couldn't happen. Um, again, when you're in these things, you want to avoid all preconceived no notions about any of the people who you suspect are involved and just stick to the evidence. It makes a world of difference in getting the investigation done quickly because that actually is one of your goals. Okay. so. Um, you, you need to do an investigation. Let's talk about the whistleblower system, which you must not maybe have in place because that's the number one way somebody's going to tip you off to a potential fraud. A whistleblower system has three hallmark characteristics. Now, some of my clients use my cell phone number. Believe it or not, whistleblower systems do not generate a lot of calls. You would be amazed how few calls it will generate. But there are many reliable systems out there, and they have three hallmark characteristics. Number one, they are absolutely anonymous. They are an anonymous to a point that even if that tip ultimately leads to some type of prosecution, you are willing to never divulge their name. In fact, you may never know their name. It has to be that anonymous and people need to know that that's what's occurring. Number two, um, a whistleblower has to be totally secure that um, there is no risk of reprisal for their uh, being forthright. Now they can be wrong, um, they can't be wrong with intent to hurt somebody else, but if their intent, if their heart is in the right place, they need to be able to, to deliver that tip with no fear of reprisal. And then last but not least, we all know that our staff watches us. Um, they know what we're doing more than we do most of the time. Um, they need to know, that tipster needs to know that you are going to actively pursue all credible tips. Um, and that's that's important. So that's the, that's the first thing you need to do in your um, uh, uh, planning a system for handling the suspicion of fraud. 
Um, there's many more things to this than just finding out about it. Um, it, 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 it can turn the organization on its head because there are so many facets to it. Because you need to follow the evidence, you have to preserve the evidence, particularly on a computer record. Um, you, we're going to talk in a little bit about the team that you're going to assemble. Um, some, some group that can accurately image uh, your entire com uh, computer system definitely part of your speed dial for handling an investigation. Um, if the imaging of the system is done poorly, it will reset the dates throughout the system. And now there's no electronic record at all uh, that, that, that can be used to, to investigate a suspicion. Um, uh, paper evidence, um, all of us do still live in the world of paper. Um, if there is a particular file cabinet that you know should be off limits now to people, if there's a particular office that should be off limits, if there's a particular laptop, all of those, you need to have a plan to tape them off and to um, uh, segregate them so that nobody's in there um, altering evidence. Um, you need to have a plan in place that allows you to deal with administrative leave of uh, 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 persons who are suspected. Um, you're, of course, going to have your counsel involved in all of this, but you're going to make sure also on your speed dial that you have the best employment lawyer you can afford, your best insurance lawyer you can afford, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of morale issues. Generally, I have, I have never seen a fraud in a public institution where uh, the morale didn't precede the problem. It's, it's almost as if the rest of the staff knows there is something wrong. They're perhaps working with somebody who's overly authoritarian, who uh, yells and screams at them, um, who um, you know, takes privilege that they're unhappy about, um, that is constantly grabbing their administrative passwords, for example, who have, who have made it something of a toxic environment anyway. Um, and then when folks realize that maybe there's something wrong, after people st st stop with the shock and the talking about it, it's the morale issues that really get to them. And the emotions, namely your emotions, um, really need to be managed. Again, planning this beforehand will save you a lot of grief. Your job, uh, is to keep the place going and and hopefully have it having it run better. Um, so it's a lot of these jobs need to be turned over to either either legal assistance or forensic assistance or whatever makes sense. Again, according to the plan that probably starting tomorrow you're going to sit down with your team and work through. Um, there is definitely a goal for uh, you're, you're going to want to get restitution if, in fact, a lot of money has been stolen. Um, fraudsters, I have the most remarkably consistent personality of anyone you will ever meet. Everyone always says after the fact, well, didn't you know that person was horribly entitled, horribly arrogant, horribly this or that? Well, I guess not, because the fraud, the fraud was able to be uh, to be perpetrated. They do have this remarkably um, uh, unique and consistent personality, and they say they spend every nickel of the money that they steal, and then some. So the chances of you're getting your money back from the, from the perpetrator are, I'd put it about zero. That's why I make sure your insurance is up to date for commercial crime. Um, you're going to need professionals to help you prepare that insurance claim. Um, maybe it's going to be referred to the police. That's secondary. Um, uh, that's, that's, some, that's a decision you'll make down the road. You're going to work your plan first, and then police referral is a different issue. Um, at, at the end of the day, just like we said at the beginning, you have to, you have to tell everybody what happened. Um, you need PR, 
public relations uh, better than better than or, or you, you need effective public relations better than anyone in the private sector. Certainly not for profits. It once a donor pool believes you're not handling something uh, professionally, all of a sudden they're not part of your donor pool anymore. It's very high stakes, but how you message them, how you communicate with them can actually make it a stronger relationship in the end, not a weaker one. The whole idea at the end is to learn from your mistakes and then don't let them persist. Be honest, fix your mistakes and be ready to communicate. Yep, that was a mistake. This is how we fixed it and we're better going forward. That's part of your plan. Okay. Um, it, it, always know your end game. Um, so you have received a tip. What you're going to want to do is sit down the people who need to know. This is a very small group of people. Never the supervisor of the person who is accused. Of course, never the person who's accused in this small group. Small group, maybe three people. Um, the first review is, okay, we have a tip. Is this possible? Is this cr a credible tip? A credible tip is one that just simply could happen. So if Sally is being accused of doing A, B, and C, but Sally couldn't possibly do B because she doesn't have access to something, well, then it's not a credible tip. A credible tip is not defined as who's being accused. Your personal feelings about the people accused or part of this or even if you know who the tipster is, that's not part of the equation. It's just simply, if this tip is true, could that person have done this? If that's a green light and you need to um, uh, investigate further, then you assemble your team. Um, it'll start with your battalion of attorneys. You'll then move to forensic staff. You'll perhaps widen your internal group you will always stay in control of this particular investigation. Never give it to someone else. Um, do know that this is about preserving relationships. So loose lips sink ships. This is not talked about outside the group. It is perhaps talked about with the person accused. They would go on administrative leave. It needs to be very confidential. And you may be apologizing to that employee shortly. Uh, and if you have to apologize, you have to apologize. No problem. Um, the police department is in many cases advised, um, but their hands are totally full with, uh, with, with violent crimes. And with all that they have to do, generally speaking, they're going to say, well, this is a financial crime. You bring me the evidence and then we'll, we'll take it to the next level. So you're going to have to go through this. Your local police department is probably not going to do this for you. Um, reasons that you want to bring in a forensic team. Um, it may be you want to see the perpetrator. You want some surveillance on them. To, and generally speaking, it's a computer surveillance. You ethically hack in and see where they're clicking and what they're doing. Many times they will totally lay it out for you, which of course makes this easy. Um, you're not going to do that surveillance. You really should have a, a third party doing, doing it. Um, security of the, comp the computer evidence couldn't be more important. The ability to image the system, preserve a copy in a safe somewhere, make a working copy that folks can get into, create evidence, and then be able to turn it over to the insurance company, turn it over to the state's attorney, whoever, whoever needs it. Um, there's a, there's, that's a, a whole drill. Um, I just recommend that you turn that over to folks who do understand how that works and can do it well for you. Again, if you do it yourself, you open yourself up to incredible liability. Try not to interview unless you know how to interview. 
um, interviewing is is one of the is one of the great skills, and um, I've seen I've seen professional interviewers do it well. It's it's an amazing thing. They will eventually put the perpetrator. Uh, they'll have them sit not behind a desk. They'll have them sit in a chair um, because the body doesn't lie, even though the lips are lying. Um, get them into a position where magically, you know, they've been shown a couple documents. They're getting a little edgy. But the thing about a fraudster is they, in their heart of hearts, want to tell you about it. They want to tell you why they did it. They want to tell you how they did it. And they also eventually want to tell you where they've kept a record of probably every transaction. It's the darndest thing. Um, so the interviewer will ultimately get them to that point. And they'll never understand why um, anyone has a problem with what they did. Um, they're very entitled people. They will always have a reason, even as crazy as I needed more jewelry. I like to go to Disney World. I got this gambling thing going. Uh, and I haven't had a raise in three years, et cetera, et cetera. But um, interviewing, make sure you've turned that over to folks who understand how to do that and do it well. It's your job as a manager to run every aspect of this investigation. Never turn it over to the members of this team who are helping you. Um, insist that people get back to you every day. Insist that as soon as there's, a, it's likely nothing happened, that this is something else or a mistake, then stop. Go apologize to the employee, get it done, move on. Remember that it's an area of your um, operation that is subject to question. That's a really good time to go look at the internal controls and try to, and try to try to strengthen it as much as you can. But as soon as you believe there's nothing to this, there is nothing worse than an investigation that just keeps going and keeps going. That is a morale, uh, that's a morale disaster. And you're under no obligation to do that. The, your obligation is to do this professionally and to take it to a point where you know with reasonable certainty that something's up or something's not. And I think we are about done. And if anybody has any questions, please, please feel free to um, um, yeah, put them in the chat. Um, again, I want you to look at this fraud incident management protocol as a fancy term. It's about a three page document. It talks about, you know, creating tone at the top and excuse me, how the how the board needs to be totally involved in this process. But think of it this way. What you want to be able to do is follow that outline. And if your team takes longer than two hours on that outline, I would be amazed you're spending too much time on it. <coughs> but take the outline, fill in the blanks. Who's going to receive the tips? How, uh, what mechanism do we use to create the tips? Define what a, what, a, what a credible tip is. Get your speed dial list together of who you're going to call. Um, and then, you know, write it all down. And then put it in a binder, probably right next to how you handle a tornado or, uh, you know, a gas leak uh, in your town um, or in your organization put it on the shelf, label it, and then, then when something happens, pull the binder, open it, work the plan. It will take all of the emotion out and it will allow you to, um, to get peace of mind very quickly and get through the investigation quickly. And so I just, I, I just, please, please download that, that protocol, the organizations that I work with that take this seriously, spend the two hours to think through it, are much better off. Um, unfortunately, everybody has fraud. And if you don't have it right this minute, you can 
probably assume that it, it's ugly head will will uh, will will show up. So again, make up make the plan, work the plan. I implore you to have a uh, a professional whistleblower system. Identify that confidential need to know group. Who are those three people? Make sure those three people will absolutely keep their mouth shut. Um, there is a period of time where no one can know. And that's when you have time to group and think. Um, there, there is nothing more lethal in a town than someone on a, on a board who then calls their best friend and says, oh my gosh, you won't believe what might have happened. And then we all know we're reading about it in the newspaper. That is not what you want. You want to be from the very beginning in total control of your message, your PR message to the rest of the world um, throughout this process. And I believe that those are all the comments that I will be making. If you could advance the slide and I'm here for any questions. We have, we have one more CPE. A well-constructed whistleblower system is the bedrock of a sound fraud prevention system. True or false? Absolutely. Um, if, it's, if it's the only thing that your organization does, um, you'll be way ahead of the game. Of course, how you handle those tips is really what 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 this presentation is all about. Um, I think we'll all remember perhaps back to the village of Dixon, one of the great stories of all time. Here was Rita, had total control of the system, not the entire system, just the points in the system, the financial system, where where she controlled it all, and of course everybody trusted her. Um, and she had quarter horses. She was the largest breeder of quarter horses in the United States. I can't think, I cannot think of a more expensive hobby. Everyone just, just sat back and said, you know, gosh, she must be very frugal or I don't know, maybe she inherited money or wow, it just seems odd, but you know, maybe on her $79,000 a year salary, that's, that's possible. And then they did find that by, by accident. Um, and they, they were investigating it. And then the day came when the FBI came to arrest her. And for whatever reason, the, um, the board had absolutely no response to all of the media coverage that came into their town. And there wasn't a spot in, uh, you know, South Africa or Somalia that didn't know about the village of Dixon when, when it hit the airwaves. And what did they look like? They looked entirely incompetent. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for um, all of their financial statements were prepared by Rita. She controlled everything. They took her word for it. Um, Yes, there was a lot of incompetence there, but the truth is it went all over the world with that message. And the point is with this type of protocol and plan, you can take control of that process. And that's what this should be all about because it's about the longevity of your um, organization. So do we have any questions? Mary, there is just one question. Um... Mm -hmm around just generalize, um, is there a reason to why governments particularly are, um, sorry, that the accounting systems do not seem to pick up any skimming? Is there any reason around that or is? is... Yeah, yeah the, um, uh, the prime reason is that governments really don't have an accounts receivable system. In the private sector, they make a widget they create an invoice and they reasonably expect a check to come in uh, in 30 days. Um, government doesn't have that. I remember when I was opening the mail one day, um, I got a check for $30,000 from um, 
Cook County, the Department of Public Health. I didn't know they knew we existed. And um, I'm looking at $30,000. It was to help us with our obesity program, which is laughable. Our biggest problem was potholes, not obesity. And um, I'm, I'm standing there looking at a check for $30,000 that I knew for a fact nobody knew was coming. Um, and I, I could have deposited it and never would have been seen again. Um, that There's a lot of those checks that come in. Also, our tax system is based on, uh, you kind of get your check. I mean, you're not, in, unless, you're, unless you're in a few states where you get to collect your own taxes, most, most don't. So you take it on faith that the check you get is, is on time uh, for the right amount. Um, often, um, you know, we'll, we'll have systems that, um, let's say, will account for recreation, you know, um, uh, someone will turn in from the recreation department X, X number of dollars for a class, but yet we, we don't have proper controls to know that um, eh, there were six other attendees who didn't make a list who paid in cash and that cash never made it to the finance department. Um, and generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of turnover. There's a lot of part-time employees. It's a system that's totally based on trust and often the internal controls aren't in place to handle um, particularly these small repetitive transactions. So like um, adjudication for parking tickets, for um, um, bonding in a county that's just has all sorts of problems. Um, our con we, we tend to have better controls around our accounting system, but not necessarily the inputs to that system. Um, and the trust is once we get a dollar, we assume that it's on time at the right amount and from the right person. Uh, and we don't have a good system for, for knowing that that is true. I think that's all for today. I um, wanted to just thank everybody again for your patience as we navigated this morning's um, technical issues and appreciate you all sticking around. And thank you so much, Mary, for your presentation. Thank you.